By the beginning of 1861, following the election of Abraham Lincoln the year prior, 11 southern states have seceded from the country and the Confederacy has been formed. After the Confederate bombardment of the U.S. Army base at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, the United States declares war to quell the rebellion and to restore the Union. A plan is then hatched to take the newly formed army that is stationed just near Washington, D.C., and to march it south into Virginia to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. The two armies will collide along the Bull Run Creek near Manassas Junction, and the stage is now set for the first great battle of the Civil War. What's up, everybody? Nick Lassalette here, and it's cold. But I'm really excited to be here. This is my first Civil War battlefield that I've been able to visit. And it's really fitting because this is Bull Run. This was the site of the first major battle during the American Civil War uh, that took place here on July 21st, 1861. So the lead up to that battle, um, the Union Army at the time it was called the Army of Northeastern Virginia. It was under a guy named Erwin McDowell. Erwin McDowell had three divisions under his command, General Tyler's division, Hunter's division and Heinzelman's division. So what they planned on doing was to occupy the Confederates which are in the southern end of the battlefield um, at a place called the Stone Bridge that runs over the Bull Run Creek. Bull Run Creek snakes along the battlefield this way and comes up behind the camera. You're not able to see it from here unfortunately. But the plan was is that the one division under Tyler was going to occupy the Confederate forces down that way that were guarding the stone bridge. I'll take you there in a little bit. While the other two divisions were gonna swing around this way, cross at Sudley Creek Ford, and make their way up to hit the Confederates on their left and rear. So at the stone bridge itself, um, there was a demi brigade under a guy named Nathan Shanks Evans. And Evans men, he had about 1100 men with him. He realized that the Union force that was gathering on the other end of Bull Run at the Stone Bridge, they weren't actually planning to attack. McDowell had ordered Tyler's division to act as a diversion to occupy Evans' brigade there, while the other two divisions came up to come around here up Matthews Hill. So he realized that, left two companies, about 200 men, to guard the Stone Bridge and took the remainder, his 900 men, here to guard Matthews Hill. And so if you look over here, this road, at the time of the battle, this was the Manassas Sudley Road. Now it's a modern day highway. But um, Hunter and Heinzelman's divisions were coming up this way with Hunter's division in the lead. And the leading brigade in the column was under Ambrose Burnside. If you know anything about the Civil War, you'll recognize that name. And as Burnside's men came up the road this way, up towards Matthews Hill, which we're standing on right now, they ran into those 900 men under Evans which were just down here at the base of the hill waiting. So at about 10.30 in the morning on that day, July 1st, 1861, um, Burnside's brigade uh, began to come up this hill and they came into sight of Evans' men which were down there between that tree line at the base of Matthews Hill um, on the crest of Buck Hill. The first regiment of Burnside's brigade that formed up on this hill was the second Rhode Island. And uh, these guns up here are supposed to represent the position of the second Rhode Island battery that came up here to unlimber in their support. And the 900 men of Evans brigade began exchanging volleys with the Rhode Island men that were on top of this hill. And for a decent amount of time, they were able to hold their own. But as the rest of Hunter's division and Heinzelman's division behind that were coming up to support the men on top of this hill, uh, they began to get outnumbered very quickly. Um, fortunately for the Confederates, Joseph E. Johnson's army of the Shenandoah was coming uh, via train to their support. So soldiers in Joseph E. Johnson's army were arriving at the southern end of the battlefield and coming up to support them. The first brigades to reach the battlefield were uh, the brigades under Bartow and B. And when General B uh, came up on the crest of Buck Hill over there and witnessed what was happening here on Matthews Hill, he had a decision to make. Um, do I send my uh, brigade of Mississippians, Georgians, and Alabamians to support Evans, 
or do I consolidate my position on the hills over there and dig in for a future union attack? And B, being an aggressive man, naturally uh, a West Point graduate and a real fighter, he decided to rush his men forward to support Evans in keeping the Union uh, tied from coming down this hill. And it became a very, very hot place. The uh, commander of the um, of Hunter, the commander of the division up here, he was wounded and Ambrose Burnside took his place. The commander of the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment was killed. Um, famously, Sullivan Ballou of the 2nd Rhode Island was killed here after he wrote his wife a letter a week prior predicting his own death. If you've ever seen the Ken Burns documentary, The Civil War, you'll know about that. Um, at one particular hot point on the action here at uh, Matthews Hill, the 4th Alabama Regiment, which was under General B, they, um, in their own initiative, decided to charge up Matthews Hill to try and break the Union line. Of course, it was fruitless, and the commander of the 4th Alabama was killed, and they were cut to pieces. And they had to retreat off the hill back towards Evans and the rest of the Confederates. It was around that time, too, when Heinzelman's division was coming up behind Hunter's that Erwin McDowell ordered Tyler's division that I mentioned earlier that was down there on the other side of Bull Run Creek at the Stone Bridge. He ordered them to cross the Stone Bridge and to converge on the Confederate right. So at that point, the Confederates were in a very tricky spot. They had um, Hunter's at that time. It was Burnside's division then and Heinzelman's division coming up here at Matthews Hill. They had Tyler's division coming up from their right, almost making a, an enveloping movement, enveloping movement. And so because of that, the Confederates had to retreat back down towards Buck Hill and Henry Hill. And the Union soldiers, and as well as their commanders, believed that the um, Confederates were being routed off the field. And so Erwin McDowell began to ride up and down his lines saying, victory, victory, the day is ours. But as we'll see, that was a very, very premature statement. So these woods right here are just to the um, left side of Matthews Hill. And um, the 8th Georgia Regiment, which was under uh, General Bartow's brigade, they formed the rightmost end of the Confederate line as they were trying to stop the Union from coming up Matthews Hill. Um, like I mentioned earlier, when Tyler's uh, division crossed the Stone Bridge, they began to envelop the uh, Confederate right flank. And so here, the 8th Georgia began uh, to take fire from multiple angles. I think it was the 1st Minnesota Regiment that uh, came on their direct right and started to pour fire onto their right flank. Um, this stone right here was made to mark the spot where uh, Private George uh, Stovall was supposedly killed. The story goes that when the 1st Minnesota started pouring fire into the 8th Mississippi's right flank, he began to taunt them, sort of yell at them about their bad aim and just kind of, you know, taunt them, make fun of them, throwing his fist up at them. And his actions in doing that sort of rallied the 8th Georgia into staying where they were and putting up a fight. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed. And this stone is supposed to mark the spot where he was killed, although it was placed later in the war. So the exact spot of his death is not necessarily known, but it was in this general vicinity somewhere after he was killed. And after the 8th Georgia realized that they were not going to be able to hold this position against those overwhelming numbers, they began to fall back that way with the rest of Evans, Bees, and Bartow's brigade. This behind me right here is the Stone House. So during the first Battle of Bull Run, July 21st, 1861, like I mentioned earlier, the fighting in that direction on Matthews Hill resulted in the Confederates under Evans, Bartow's, and Bees' brigades retreating this way as they were being enveloped by the Union Army under Erwin McDowell and they swarmed past this house as they were trying to make their way up that way towards Henry Hill and the Henry house and this house was used as an aid station really for both sides and it quickly quickly filled up with wounded from both sides and if you look closely at this building today you can still see the evidence of the fighting that happened here. 
So if you look closely at the stone house here on the Bull Run Battlefield, you can see the scars of battle. Um, like this up here, there we are. Um, that's either a rifle artillery round or a fuse. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but over here, there's no mistaking what this is. That is a cannonball that is embedded into the wall. Either, I think, a four pounder or a six pounder. But yeah, this house definitely took a beating during the battle. All right, sorry in advance about the noise. Uh, the road here is pretty busy and it's windy. Anyways, this here is Young's Branch. It's a little creek that leads up to the Bull Run Creek, which is up in that direction. So that right there is the stone house, which we were just at. Just beyond is Matthews Hill. And like I was mentioning earlier, the Confederates in the beginning part of the day were retreating up this way or down this way towards Henry Hill, which is up in that direction. And to cover that retreat, um, the 4th Alabama Regiment, which I mentioned earlier, had charged up Matthews Hill at the Rhode Islanders and had gotten cut to pieces. They had reformed here just at this road intersection to cover the retreat as the rest of the Confederates had moved down this way. And Erwin McDowell, you know, I guess uh, other historians like to point at this part of the battle as an example of his, I guess, lack of urgency. He spent time reorganizing his army, reor reorganizing the brigades and the divisions up that way. Because again, this was their first battle, and so they really didn't know what they were doing a whole lot. So they were spending time getting reorganized up there. In the meantime, he sent one regiment, the 27th New York. They came down this way to flush out the Alabamians from this road intersection, which they did pretty quickly, and the Alabamians retreated across this creek and up Henry Hill. But when that happened, the New Yorkers began to receive fire from up that direction, from Wade Hampton's um, South Carolinian Legion. And they were positioned up at a place called the Robinson House. It's not there anymore. I'll show you the foundations of that in just a little bit. But it was owned by a freed black man. Uh, his first name escapes me, but he had done pretty well for himself. He owned a pretty big plot of land, a lot of cows, horses, and sheep, and whatnot. And he was cowering in the basement of his house while this fight was going on. And so the South Carolinians were firing down on the turnpike from this direction, and the North, or the, I'm sorry, the New Yorkers wheeled to their left this direction to face the South Carolinians. And in doing so, they didn't realize that at the top of the hill here, also helping to cover the retreat was the 7th Georgia. And part of the reason why they didn't recognize the danger that the 7th Georgia posed to them was because the 7th Georgia was also wearing blue uniforms. Again, this is the first major battle of the war and both sides are kind of using what they had. And so seeing those blue clad soldiers on top of the hill there, they didn't realize that they were Confederates and started moving down the hill to face the South Carolinians. When the Georgians up on top of that hill leveled their rifles at the New Yorkers, they finally realized their mistake, and the Georgians let loose a very concentrated volley at the New Yorkers. And between the fire from the Georgians and the fire from the South Carolinians, the New Yorkers were forced to retreat back up that way. Um, and then two more regiments uh, followed in their wake, and they again were pushed back by the Georgians and the South Carolinians. And when that happened, both sides kind of drew off at a safe distance while on Henry Hill, Thomas J. Jackson and his 1st Virginia Brigade had arrived to start reinforcing the defenses on Henry Hill. All right, we are at the Robinson House. That is what it looked like during the war. This is what it looks like now. Nothing left, but still a really iconic spot here on the Bull Run Battlefield. So if you look closely in front of me, right there, that's the Warrington Turnpike. And just over here, there we are, there is the Stone House and the intersection of the Sudley Road and the Warrington Turnpike. So right there is where the 4th Alabama would have been covering the retreat of the Confederates as they came off of the Matthews Hill. That is also where the 27th New York would have came down to flush them out. And of course, Right here, right in front of the Warrington Turnpike would have been Wade Hampton's South Carolinians. And the 7th Georgia would have been just to their left right here. So as the Alabamians would have been retreating towards Henry Hill, which is over there, the New Yorkers would have wheeled to their left, like I mentioned earlier, and come up this way to deal with Wade Hampton's soldiers here. 
again, they didn't notice the Georgians here in their blue uniforms, and those two regiments cut the 27th New York to pieces, as well as the follow-up regiments that tried to consolidate this area. That day as the confederates were retreating off of matthews hill past the stone house they made their last defensive line on that ridge over there this is henry hill named after the henry house this was owned by an 85 year old widow at the time of, of the battle her name was judith henry and during the battle she was actually bedridden for some unknown reason either she was super sick or super old who knows but um before the armies got to this hill um, her two sons tried to remove her from the house on a mattress. Um, however, the intensity of the artillery fire didn't allow them to go any further from the vicinity of the house. So they went back inside the house to seek some protection. That's when um, Colonel or Captain Ricketts, I can't remember his rank off the top of my head right now, um, of Company I of the 1st U.S. Artillery, he formed up his guns on either side of this house. You can see an example of that right there on the other side of the house. And there were Confederate sharpshooters actually within the house itself that were firing down on his artillerymen. So he turned one of his guns, pointed at the house in this direction, and fired a shell through it. And that was successful in forcing the Confederates to leave the house and make their way back towards their defensive line there. Unfortunately, that shell that went through the house ended up blowing the feet off of Judy, or Judith Henry while she was laying in her bed, and she was mortally wounded and ended up dying uh, later that night, and she is actually buried just over there. If you know anything about the Civil War, you know who this is. This is Thomas J. Jackson, or as most people remember him as Stonewall Jackson. And of course, this is the spot where he earns that nickname Stonewall Jackson. And how did that come to be? Well, if you remember from earlier, when up at Matthews Hills, the brigades of uh, Evans, Bees, and Bartow's brigades were retreating off this way, they took shelter behind Henry Hill over here. Seeing Jackson's 1st Virginia Brigade along the crest of the hill right here, he tried, uh, B tried to rally his men to try and help reinforce the defensive line here. As he was trying to rally his men to move them up to the defense line, he pointed towards General Jackson and said, Look, men, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. And it worked, as most of the remaining men that had survived the previous action of that day moved up to help reinforce the Virginians. Now, did he say that exactly? We don't know for sure because B was mortally wounded and died um, here that day. So, as uh, Captain Ricketts of Company I of the 1st U.S. Artillery unlimbered on the other side of the Henry House over there, right here would have been Company D of the 5th U.S. Artillery under uh, Captain Griffins. And he had an idea of taking two howitzers and placing them in a position where they could fire down on the Confederate cannons, which if you look in that direction, past the Stonewall Jackson Monument, are just right there, just a couple hundred yards in that direction. Um, for about an hour or so, there was a massive artillery duel as both sides began to send shells back and forth to each other. Those two howitzers that were positioned just around this area were charged and captured by the 33rd uh, Virginia Infantry Regiment. And they were able to take those guns and hold this area and threaten the Union position here at Henry Hill. So as the 33rd Virginia Infantry Regiment captures those two howitzers um, and that artillery duel continues, on the other side of the Henry House, uh, where Ricketts Battery is, there are um, the Battalion of the U.S. Marines. And the 4th and the 27th Virginia Infantry on the other side are pouring lead into those Marines. And these are not the same Marines that um, charged the Fortress of Chapultepec in the Mexican-American War. 
These are raw recruits. They're really green. They've only had a few weeks of training. And so they quickly abandon Henry Hill and leave Ricketts guns really exposed. And it is around this time that um, the Virginians begin to focus their attention on the artillery guns themselves. And Ricketts battery is almost obliterated. Ricketts himself is wounded and his second in command, Ramsey, is killed. Um, Ricketts famously exclaims to his uh, men and uh, the Marines, boys, for God's sake, save my battery. But it's to no avail and he is eventually captured that day. standing on the Confederate defensive line here at Henry Hill. These guns right here represent the 13 Confederate cannons that would have been laid out along this ridge. So like I mentioned earlier, that over there is the Henry House. On either side would have been Ricketts Battery and Griffin's Battery. The two howitzers that were on that side, on Griffin's side of the Henry House, they were captured by the 33rd Virginia Infantry Regiment, and they hauled onto it for a decent amount of time until the 14th Brooklyn Zouaves charged the two howitzers and recaptured them from the 33rd uh, Virginia and the 33rd Virginia was forced to retreat back across this ridge. Seeing this, Jackson told the 4th and the 27th Virginia Infantry Regiments, who at that time were shooting at the Marines over on that side of Henry House, after the Marines had retreated off of Henry, uh, Henry Hill, he told the 4th and 27th to reserve your fire until they are 50 yards away and then give him the bayonet. And when you charge, yell like furies. And that's exactly what they did. And when they charged, that was the first rebel yell of the war, and that yell would be repeated over thousands of battlefields for the years to come. Thus begins a sway back and forth of Virginians, other Confederate units trying to take the Union batteries and other Union regiments being fed into the fight. And this lasts for about an hour. This is the most intense phase of the Battle of Bull Run. So in that hour of fighting here uh, on either side of the Henry House for the Union batteries, the Union position here at Henry Hill is really hanging in the balance. And all it takes is just more reinforcements from Joe Johnson's Army of the Shenandoah to arrive to reinforce Jackson's line to stop the Union tide. And those reinforcements show up in the form of General Koch's Brigade and General Bonham's Brigade. They show, they show up here, excuse me, from Manassas Junction just south of the railway station. They move up here and they launch an attack of the Union position at the Henry House and they finally push the Union soldiers off of Henry Hill for good. It almost becomes a rout then and there when Erwin McDowell tries to make one last effort with a handful of brigades, or sorry, a handful of regiments to retake the guns and continue the fight. But more reinforcements under uh, General Elsley and General Jubal Early show up and it's too much for the Union soldiers and they are forced to retreat back the way they came, back across Henry Hill, across the Stone Bridge. Um, Brigadier General Howard's 5th Brigade shows up to try and form some sort of rear guard to try and uh, allow the Union soldiers to retreat in good order. But the Confederate reinforcements are just too strong and they too are forced to rout off the field. And the Union retreat becomes so chaotic that they call it later the Great Skedaddle. Some Union soldiers run all the way until they make it to Washington, D.C. And thus ends the Battle of Bull Run in a Confederate victory. Um, the first major battle of the war is the first, um, or sorry, is the bloodiest battle in American history up until that time. Uh, people were shocked and sobered about how this war has begun, and they quickly realized that this war will be a long and bloody affair. However, the battles that take place soon after Bull Run in the succeeding years continue to dwarf the numbers that were involved here at Bull Run. While this was still a large and bloody battle, it pales in comparison to some of the other battles that are going to happen in the years to come.
This is the stone bridge. This is actually not the original one. It was destroyed during the second battle of Bull Run in August, 1862 and was rebuilt after the war. But this is where uh, Brigadier General Evans would have had his brigade guarding the stone bridge on this side of the Bull Run Creek. This right here is the Bull Run Creek. Um, he left his two companies, about 200 men to guard the bridge while he took the rest of his brigade that way towards Matthews Hill to guard that area. About a mile and a half in that direction is the Robinson House, which was the anchor of the Confederate right flank during the battle. When McDowell ordered the uh, division under General Tyler to cross the Bull Run Creek this way, they used this bridge and also a fordable spot uh, about a half a mile upstream. That's actually where uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's brigade crossed the Bull Run Creek and went on to make their unsuccessful attempts to crack the Confederate defenses on Henry Hill. Um, but yeah, this is a very iconic spot on the Bull Run battlefield. And of course, later on in the day, when the Union Army was routed off the field, they retreated, of course, down Matthews Hill and also down this bridge as well, where a really chaotic scene uh, happened where the roads just beyond the bridge became so clogged with retreating men. It was a really chaotic mess. But I'm very happy to be here and it's a very beautiful place. So that was the Battle of First Bull Run. And before I sign off, I just want to say a big thanks to the National Park Service and of course to the American Battlefield Trust for allowing people like me to come here and to use their resources to better understand exactly what happened here and to get a better perspective on the Civil War. So again, big thank you to those guys and thank you very much for watching. Sons in my face. Sons in my fucking face. <laughs> All right, you. I mean, you can go whenever oh, it's fine. recording. Okay. It's recording. Okay. <laughs> All right. When um, no, no, no. <laughs> okay.